Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Wenzel Dowling. I'm a microbiologist, as Mr. Prince mentioned. I'm going to take you guys uh, through a little bit of the more technical aspects of bone uh, penetration of antibiotics. Um, I know as clinicians, you guys probably just bear with me. Um, it will be fine, um, hopefully. So, um, as you well know, um, the common organisms in, in bone and joint infections include um, staphylococci, staph aureus, CNSs, intracocci, um, the, the intrabacterales, um, as well as streptococci and um, things such as cutibacterium pacnus. Um, so I'm going to talk you guys through um, some of the aspects of some of the studies um, quickly. I'm going to not um, dwell too much on certain aspects because of time. Just uh, um, first, what are the tissue factors um, affecting or influencing the target site concentration? Now, there are tissue penetration um, aspects and there's target tissue characteristics. So in the, when choosing an antibiotic, um, you need to think about um, things such as protein binding, the size of the antibiotic, whether it's hydro, uh, uh, whether it's lipophilicity or is it hydrophilic, as well as the de degree of ionization. And then target tissue characteristics in bone. Um, with capillary fenestration, we know bone um, is dense. It uh, consists of uh, cancellous bone, um, and compact bone, the compact bone um, can be more difficult to penetrate with capillary fenestration being less. You need to also take that into consideration. And then penetration in inflamed tissue. So infected versus non-infected bone um, is important. Um, and then also certain antibiotics um, are bind to the hydroxy uh, apatate in the bone, um, which includes quinolones, fosfomycin, and, and imipenem. That's also a thing to take into consideration. Just a table on... Um, Hydrophilic versus lipophilic antibiotics, like I said, lipophilic antibiotics better um, or better penetration into bone, which includes fluoroquinolones, macrolides, and azelaine, It does not mean you can't use the other um, antibiotics. Um, it is just better uh, penetration normally in bone. Um, the differences between uh, the, the two low uh, volume of distribution hydrophilic antibiotics, so it's as stays mostly in the plasma versus lipophilic likes to go out of the plasma, penetrates better, therefore. Um, and then another factor is uh, the pathogen factors. Here's an example, Staph aureus, which can also influence target site um, concentration. As we well know, abscess formation, difficult for antibiotics to penetrate in abscesses. Uh, sequestrum, once again, also difficult. Other, other things, the, the diffusion through the bone, as well as persister cells and small colony variants, specifically um, with Staph aureus. It's also, I'm gonna discuss it um, a little bit later. And other um, things include um, the, and, and um, the bacteria penetrating deeper into the deeper structures, the osteoclasts, um, the Kuna um, canicular um, invasion, which um, makes it more difficult for, their, your, anti, for, for your antibiotic to penetrate. Um, Bioavailable agents, oral agents, important, don't forget them. In this table, just a nice summary, anything above 80% bioavailability in green, and those are, as you guys well know, um, options we, we, we tend to use for bone infections um, as oral options. So um, just the advantages of intravenous administration, um, we can use higher doses, it bypasses the intestines, it avoids malabsorption, and it avoids heavy metals such as iron, which we, we um, often give to our elderly patients with prosthetic joint infections. Um, and who can have an early oral switch? If you have a susceptible microorganism, complete wound closure and infection control, no massive bone graft, good antibiotic tolerance and observance, treatment understood and, and accepted by the patient. So just this table, I'm not going to stick with it too long, just in the, the table in blue, um, oral antibiotic therapy, what are the advantages? Obviously no venous access, no risk of catheter-related complications and better rehabilitation and uh, mobility. Uh, so we should think of it um, uh, when treating. You guys probably well know this trial, the Aviva trial, which showed um, that uh, treatment failure assessed after one year show was non-inferior to intravenous antibiotic therapy, looking at, at different subgroups, even in a worst case sensitivity analysis, it was still shown to be non-inferior. So oral options are an option for, for um, bone and joint infections. 
So what are the limitations of bone penetration um, studies? So I'm going to start off with um, just criticizing it a little bit um, and then talk it through. So most bone penetration studies, the sample sizes were small um, and the, the bone sampling was often done on healthy patients undergoing joint arthroplasty or just standard um, uh, procedures such as hip replacements and such, which, as I mentioned earlier, infected versus non-infected bone. So the bone penetration studies were mainly, mainly done on non-infected bone. Often um, the older studies, they use single antibiotic administration prior to, to uh, collecting um, the bone tissue. And um, studies have shown using various dosages, which is another problem. The extracellular um, plasma and intracellular plasma concentration ratios were often not distinguished. And different methodologies were used in, in um, calculating these ratios and percentages, which I'll show you a little bit later. So many studies applied a variety of methods, like I said, to measure the bone concentrations, and that's a problem. Results of all the studies will differ if uh, repeated now, and the reason for it is all the assays were used to, to calculate the bone, um, uh, the, the bone antibiotic concentrations, where we've progressed into more sen sensitive and more specific methods, which I'll show you. Um, and then furthermore, the bone plasma ratio data are often not informative concerning antibiotic activity. Like I said, uh, there's cortical bone, there's cancerous bone. The, the, the penetration of antibiotics differs between cancerous and cortical bone, and often studies didn't take that into account. They are either homogenized, the cortical and the, uh, the cancerous bone together, or they only tested one aspect of the bone, which is another limitation. So um, what are PK, PD problems with bone penetration? Like I said, there are different method, methods used. The, the earlier methods were bioassays and microbiological assays, um, progressed into a high-performance liquid chromatography. And now the latest um, method used is, is uh, liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry. Now that um, harnesses the separation abilities of liquid chromatography with identification um, methods or advantages of two different mass spectrometers used at two different stages um, of testing the antibiotic in the bone. So separation versus homo um, homogenization, should we separate, should we should studies look at cortical and cancerous bones separately, or should they test them homogenized together? Mm -hmm. um, the latest studies have shown separation is better. Like I said, the penetration of antibodies can differ um, between the two. <laughs> Looking at PK PD parameters, uh, using the area under the curve is best. As we well know, there are concentration dependent and time dependent antibiotics, but they found the area under the curve to be best. Um, using, using multiple bone samples at different time points to get a, a complete view to be able to work out the, the, the area on the, the curve versus the older studies that only looked at single um, bone biopsies. Um, I've mentioned uninfected and infected bone. Um, site of sampling is important. What studies have shown different sites of sampling from long bones to using the mandibular or maxillary bone structures, all of those can differ. And then um, using pharmacokinetic studies to try and um, work out um, what our, our PD, uh, PK, uh, PKPD target should be. Earlier studies, they used um, something called naive, naive averaging approach and naive, naive pooling, um, which mainly focuses on concentration time profiles and didn't concentrate or look at the intersubject variability. So the gold standard for, for, for looking at, at the PK, PK or trying to calculate PKPD targets is population pharmacokinetic analysis on the right, which considers both the average antibacterial penetration as well as the intersubject variability um, and can, um, can be used um, on one sample to determine, um, to, to, to determine a, a, the, the broad area under the curve for one patient using a bigger population of samples. So um, what are the measures of bone penetration? It's different between studies. Um, uh, what I've seen, um, Landisdorfer et al. Landisdorfer uh, has um, seemed to, to uh, been doing this for quite some while, using average bone yeah. serum concentration ratio, where Coffee et al. in 2022 uh, looked at bone concentration mean above the epidemiological cutoff value. Uh, and compared to Tabita et al. 2019, used the bone concentration mean above 
CLSI breakpoint or a global surveillance, two global surveillance studies using the MRC90. And then bone serum percentage could also have also been used. So as you can see, studies, the, the, the measures, the heterogeneous, the way they calculated it. And it is, and it's, it, it, it is an issue. Um, so going on first to Landis Dorfer study in 2020, um, where they took 39 healthy patients uh, with ciprofloxacin specifically. Um, they, they infused the 400 milligrams before the orthopedic surgery. It was normally done in healthy patients. It was normally done in hip surgeries. And then they collected bone samples at um, two different time periods. Um, and they looked at cortical and cancellous bone. On the graphs here, you can see the probability of target attainment. I'm looking at differences between plasma and co um, cortical bone and cancellous bone. Um, and they found that the concentrations um, were actually quite high um, versus serum, um, which we well know was ciprofloxacin. This is one of the few, a few studies that I've uh, looked at that used like a reverse engineering approach to look at um, actually calculating probability of target attainment. Um, the blue line is the, the current CLSI clinical breakpoint. Um, for ciprofloxacin. And as you can see, if you look at the graphs, the probability of target attainment is at MRC is lower than that one. So it is it has shown to be um, good penetration, both cortical and cancerous bone. However, um, the authors did mention that they still um, sh should still view it with caution as there could be differences um, in sample testing between different bones. Um, but this is uh, the best study I found on on bone penetration. The, Can I ask, sorry, yeah. sorry, what was the target they used? So, so, so um, a specific target. Yeah, I mean, so that's a probability of target yes, and yes. simulation. What target did they use? What I assume it was an AUC. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so sorry. So, yeah, so this, uh, so, so this latest study used AUC. What was the AUC target so, and how was it derived? So, 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 so I, I don't know exactly how it was derived, but it, it, it was. Um, as far as I remember, point four. Yeah, you see, I mean, that's the problem. Yeah. Right? So where do these AUC targets come yeah, from? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so this is one of the first studies that, that they mentioned used a reverse engineering approach. The, the studies that I'm going to mention after this didn't cal calculate graphs like this. Yeah. The, 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 the previous studies, the PKPD targets were unknown. <coughs> so, this one's also unknown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. Yeah. so, so it is a, a, a gray area. Yes. So the, the earlier study in 2009 by Landon Wilfer et al. Um, just showing the graph of different, not only um, equinolone like superfloxacin, um, they used linazolid as the, 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 the perfect antibiotic for bone penetration because they found the characteristics of linazolid in bone to be lipophilic, to be um, good, uh, uh, good penetration into bone and other characteristics. So, they set it out at a median bone um, serum concentration of 0.4 to be the best. And as you can see, uh, quinolones, macrolides, um, and tetracyclines uh, is above that. It does not mean that you can't use any of the others. They just, in this study, um, mention it like that. This is one of the, one of the earlier studies. Um, a, a further study by Koch et al., is the different method methodology, they looked at bone concentration, um, mean above our epidemiological cutoff value done by UCOS. Yeah, just mentioned a few, Kefazolin, um, looking at E-coli and Staph aureus, you can see the means are somewhat higher for E-coli and Staph aureus because uh, Kefazolin has a good bone pen penetration. They had one caveat and they said it's essential to know if the free concentration of Kefazolin to, to know if the concentration in bone of kefazolin is important because the protein binding is high. As one of the first slides, I said protein binding is a problem. And then Fluclox, um, also once again for Stap aureus above the EECOF, of um, the epidemiological cutoff value, which shows you can use Fluclocoxacin. Um, with amoxicillin and ampicillin, um, mostly above E. coli and astrepsip uh, agalactiase um, ECOFs. However, with um, amoxicillin, the author said you should be using high dosing and the, the, the query the problem with possible side effects of the high dosing. And also in the red block, 
This is specific studies looking at maxillary and mandibular <coughs> tissue, which showed poorer um, bone penetration as compared to other bones. With ciprofloxacin, you can see the means are quite high with Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, and E. coli, as it penetrates bone well, as mentioned in the previous study. Um, looking at vancomycin, there's a variability between studies, um, and uh, one thing to, is important is your uh, therapeutic drug monitoring to, to optimize that, to allow the vancomycin obviously be in the therapeutic range, be above um, the, the ecological cutoff or epidemiological cutoff values as seen in this study. Um, Tabit et al. looked at it and said this table, I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but they showed um, bone concentrations means above the, the CLSI break, clinical breakpoint, um, which was quite high in keftazidine, kefabine, flucloxis, and amoxicillin. Um, throughout the studies um, of the kef tri uh, of the sphalosporins, kefapine was, uh, had very good bone penetration. Um, as you can see, uh, um, the cortical bone concentration of 67.7, which was far superior for different bacteria, um, the, the, the MICs, the clinical breakpoints, which is um, yeah, which is interesting. And then uh, another study, 2012, Spalberg and all looked at um, different drugs. I'll just summarize some of them that we use here. Bone penetrations, as in the previous study by Ladd and also all, they used a um, 0.4 as, as good penetration, which would equate to 40% here. Yeah? So anything about 40%, um, which will be decent. Um, the cephalosporins, they somewhat below the 40%, um, but at high dosages, they should penetrate. Um, please note there's different oral options, as well as some of the options, kefazolin, ke um, for instance, keftazidine, they're differing dose, dosages, different studies, um, which is also a, a problem. It wasn't that standardized, um, the studies that these um, authors looked at. And then um, finally, just to summarize, as we well know, um, good penetration profiles in bone tissue exists for amoxicillin, tuptaz, cloxicillin, all cephalosporins, carboplenins, aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolone, vancomycin, clindamycin, trimethoprim, and rifampicin, few exceptions, um, penicillin and metronidazole well, um, showed lower than optimum uh, penetration into bones should not be used, but the others um, should be fine. Just going into specifics, trimethoprim, sulfamidoxazole, I know we discussed a lot on the rounds um, as an oral option. Um, uh, many authors have supported the, the use of high-dose um, trimethoprim, sulfamidoxazole, um, the, they also mentioned the importance of concurrent surgical debridement and also um, the benefit of potential adjunctive rifampicin therapy in treating chronic um, osteomyelitis um, and just highlighting some, some of the studies there. Um, in a specific study by Dr. Nink et al. Um, in 2019 on the graphs, blue is good. It means um, in this study of 51 patients, um, the, the, there was good outcomes at 7, 45, and 90 days. On the graph on B, it showed uh, the outcomes at 90 days with um, uh, trimethoprim sulfamatoxazole combined with fluoroquinolone, combined with rifampicin, and combined with other drugs, showed to have overall good outcomes. Um, and they mentioned that it'd be useful in salvage situations in both gram negatives and gram positives. This specific study had a, had a good subset. It only had 51 patients, but 47% um, of, of these patients were presenting with the uh, bacterial joint infections with gram negatives. So, um, so a good, good spread for both gram negatives and gram positives. And then um, just looking at um, one um, study, looking at um, Staphylococcus aureus, looking at um, uh, MRSA versus MSSA, and looking at um, models, um, pharmacodynamic, pharmacodynamic models for Staphylococcal bioform, um, and showed high failure rates um, using um, trimethoprim sulfamidoxazole, and they attributed that to um, thymidine. There's also further studies that mention uh, increase in thymidine in necrotic tissue, in pus, and that could um, uh, be a problem in Staphylococcus aureus due to small colony variants. 
Um, and also in the study, uh, trimethoprim sulfon toxidotoxol did not protect against rapamycin resistance, and myonin therapy was somewhat ineffective. This was um, on, obviously in opposition um, to what I mentioned previously with the clinical study. So, and uh, levofloxacin, um, we well know levofloxacin is in the guidelines and can be used for, for Staphylococcus aureus and the intrabacterialis. Just a snippet at the top, um, sh showing from Lava Basir at all, showing that it is used, and as you well know. Um, just regarding the tolerability of um, levofloxacin, Volmed all looked at it, and, and what they find is found that there was significantly higher um, drug discontinuation rates with levofloxacin rifampicin regimen compared to a non fluoroquinolone, 27.5 versus 4.2. Um, and also had more severe adverse effects. Um, a, a further study um, showed that there are no definite co conclusions can be drawn on the use of uh, levofloxacin for intracocal bone infections, and it's in line with the UPOS um, uh, that does not recommend it for this purpose. And if we look at um, just the one of these graphs again, um, looking at levofloxacin, the means for Entrococcus fecalis, that Entrococcus fecalis at the top, um, that's the epidemiological cutoff value according to UCOS. The CLSI M100 2023 breakpoint one, however, is lower at one. Um, but in terms of UCOS and CLSI, um, it states that levofloxacin, ciprofloxacin for intracocal infections should only be reported for urine. Um, so, as you can see in the, in the table at the bottom, the, the U um, represents urine. And that's the, the, the latest guidelines. So in conclusion, um, when studying bone um, penetration studies, population PK analysis um, using AUC um, should be used. You should look at cortical and cancellous bone. Uh, you should use the, the, the best or the most sensitive methodology, which is a, a liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry. Um, you should use standardized MIC criteria. You should try and follow guidelines as much as possible. TDM should be considered um, to, to optimize um, drug levels in the plasma and then hopefully the bone. A multidisciplinary approach should be followed, which we will do. Um, we should remember our highly bioavailable options. Um, Care will invariably have, have to be optimized, uh, individualized. As we know, it's often complex with multiple organisms, long um, stay in hospital, um, multiple samples having been sent, and long courses of antibiotics. And then um, the combination therapy in um, oral options, um, for instance, combining it, combining trimethoprim sulfamethoxidol with another option um, to prevent failure um, in trimethoprim could be considered. So these are uh, my references. Um, thank you. Well, we take questions now. I, think, I mean, maybe someone has a specific question related to your talk, and then afterwards we can also discuss your problem. Thanks very much, Lovely. Um, you're using more and more like cyclists. Um, but there wasn't on any of your lists. What have you been able to find about tigercycline? So, 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 so tigercycline penetration, similar to the other tetracyclines, penetration is good. All the studies that did, did not include it, but what I found from the latest studies, um, studies um, 2020, Landersdorfer and Kochetol, um, have been showed, but um, all tetracyclines have good penetration into bone. Uh, sorry, Landersdorfer? For, 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 no, I mean, you, you showed that some penetration in, yeah. the, in that study. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so yeah, the, the, in the study, they didn't mention why. They, the, they summarized a, a, a variety of studies and they, they did mention that, but they didn't explain why, because it wasn't a specific study. Um, they were just reviewing it. Is there anything about that area that has different I mean, It's panels? quite strange because, in general, um, in, in factual infections and in the facial bones, it's less common because their blood supply is so good. So, so actually, the, you know, all other complications we have for peripheral bones like immune is 
has a lower incidence in patient bones because of the better blood supply. So I would have thought intuitively, yeah. but there must be another explanation. I, well, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, the, the, the possible explanation is is the nature of the studies, the older studies um, using microbiological assays which were less sensitive. Um, and, and therefore might have had worse compared to newer ones. I think that's my, the heterogeneous nature of, of the studies in the past. Yeah. So I mean, it's certainly we have quite a few barriers. You know, so you've got your bone that might be infected, then you've got a plate on the bone, and then you've got an abscess around that. And then in my game in spinal surgery, you might have little cavities between the bone and the screw. So you know, it's, it's not just the bone you're looking at; it's really how that antibiotic gets through all those structures. Um, you know, is, is anything that just like you know, they're looking when they put instrumentation in and how we. You know, get to those areas, or they're sampling those areas as well. Well, well, currently these are the best bone penetration studies that I could find. None of them, like I said, most of these studies are not being done you know, on an infective. infective yeah. bone. So, so the delivery of the antibody to these structures would be via the blood supply, not diffusion. I mean, with the... no, no, no. So, 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 so not um, the direct it would be given before the um, procedure or yeah, yeah. tissue biopsy. Um, and then, yeah, but there's a mechanism be given in the blood, the blood gets to the bone yes. and it goes through the bone. So, we actually have to rely on the fusion as well from a vascularized area, often to a poorly vascularized area. Often, our infections are in a poorly vascularized area adjacent. I mean, there's some yeah. bone infections, obviously, they keep you know, yeah. on myelitis, but the ones that we struggle with that need long term problems are the ones where the infection is often adjacent to the bone. But that's also why the Failure rate of our surgery is so high because you know antibiotics can't get to the yeah. Well, it's diffuse, so well. it's a different uh, delivery medium. You know, it gets fed at the bone with the blood, yeah. it's going to diffuse through other tissue. Yeah, like like my third slide with that uh, model of, of staph aureus, you yeah. abscess and squestrum and things. That's <laughs> multiple issues potentially. Um, there's a, a, a um, technique called microdialysis that they've tried using, where they specifically bore into the bone directly. And um, send a, a small catheter to actually monitor the the, um, the antibody concentrations, which um, might be able to this catheter might be able to get into other spaces, yeah. um, like you mentioned, in between the bone and, and cavities and things like that, yeah. um, which could be an option. But currently, I, I, I haven't seen anything uh, specific. Yeah, I think I'm There's an online question here from Bob Brunk asking why would flu clocks have. If you look at the graphs, there's almost no joint. There's some bone penetration, there's almost no joint penetration. Would you have an idea why that would be? I, I, I don't know the, the answer to that specifically why there won't be any joint penetration for flu cloxacin, but mentioning um, the drugs such as flu cloxacin, cloxacillin, oxacillin, napsillin, all of those, the, the, the studies, um, they're very heterogeneous. They, they often don't have proper break point criteria and things like that. Just mm -hmm. based on how we use it and, and what the CLSI and the UFOS um, report. But I, I, do, I don't know the differences why the explanation of why you won't have flu cloxacin penetration into it's rather a moot point because the barrier isn't so much bone penetration per se, but difficulty in tolerability of yeah, yeah. high-dose yeah. blood so so all the and yeah. yeah. so, I mean, it, it's an interesting question, but it, from a management point of view, they tend to use glucoxin and an oral agent. In the US, they use glucoxin or IV. So, so, so actually, so my, my one other question is um, the use of uh, kephalexin. Is that also, uh, the, or the non-use of kephalexin, is that also side effects based? Um, because I do see it um, using uh, kephalexin as suppressive therapy. Um, in, uh, I, I must say, we've never really used it as an oral agent. I know we, they have used an oral agent as pediatrics, um, we, they've used it as a sort of flu clox substitute and give an exit. I know it's been part of using these, but we've never, I don't really know why it was never really recommended. So, now when we away from flu clox as a oral agent of choice with staph infections, it was the recommendation to use quadrimoxazole, but I don't really know why give has never been, been um, recommended. Yeah, it was a I've never used it. Um, 
That's why we're familiar with it. And I think it's familiar. But it, yeah, it was used in pediatrics, especially when flu class is not available. So the third printer that's back because about a year ago I tried to write them up and my physician told me there's a black box warning we don't to use them. Now I see we're using them all over the place again. There are there are three or four black box warnings on the printer that so it's not a drug we, we particularly want to use from that point of view, but it is got very good penetration as well with their biofilm activity. And so but all the digital thing in the talk was the issue about the flux and then the caucus because that's come up a number of times, and there's a been a move some quarters towards the really flock. I think but that doesn't look like a very good idea. Yeah, so I think you've said with that. I think it's a lot to do with the patients not tolerating or saying they can't tolerate the high dose uh, amoxicillin three times a day. And better, it's an hour experience with the BD lever or the, yeah. your data than the yeah, but not to use it for We're using a 20%. Yeah, we well, uh, they attributed it to the lever box. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's, it's also, also it's well, interesting. Um, in charity, if you look at the diagnostic graph here, once a gram negative bone infection is quinolone resistant, they basically classify it as impossible to eradicate from the mainstream expression. So um, it just shows that the quinolone is the most effective drug in gram negative bone joint infections. So you have to use it. And if, and if we don't have that, then the outcome is definitely worse. And, um, and for, for my uh, brief um, going to the, the author's ward rounds, um, I, I see the uh, use of meropenem versus kefepime. Um, do, you, do you guys use kefepime? I must say, when it comes to those antibiotics, we heavily rely on your guys' recommendations. I would have, so we never make those decisions on our own. Um, well, we do use uh, We do use kefepime. Yeah, no, no. Uh, it's more, uh, we need therapy. Yeah, yeah, so well, well it, 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 and direct mm -hmm. with guidelines uh, have shown vancomycin and kefepine because uh, as I showed, kefepine is excellent bone penetration. Yeah. So, I'd have to look back. I mean, when we looked at our, we repeated like a study that was done in Oxford, the actual bone infection unit, looking at all the susceptibility of their um, common pathogens and then to come up with the best empiric therapy. And their answer was meropenem and, and, and vancomycin. And we repeated that try it, and the answer was the same. And I'm pretty certain we looked at Kipim as well, but I can't remember the top of my head, but, but definitely the best combination was uh, meropenem and vancomycin. But it might be very close to the different people have to go and look back at those tables. Thanks. There'll be time for more discussion. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ying Zhao. I'm a ID fellow, and my talk today will be focusing on antibiotics penetration into bowel flows and implication for management of bone infection. So we now appreciate that periprosthetic joint infection is associated with biofilm on the surface of the implant. Typically, bacteria have the chance of contacting the surface of the implant at the time when the implant is placed. But alternatively, that can happen hematogenously after the implant is placed at any time or by continuous spread. Once bacteria have established themselves into bowel films on the implant surface, the treatment with many of the antibiotics, as well as response from the host immune systems, becomes more challenging. Once recognizing a periprosthetic joint infection, we need to think about microbiology and which organisms are causing the infection. Most commonly, we're looking at gram-positive bacteria. Um, especially staphylococci, um, staph aureus, and coagulase negative staphs, and staph epidermidis in particular. Aerobic gram-negative bacteria, including members of the Enterobacterales and Pseudomonas species are less common, but do occur. And anaerobic bacteria play a small but important role in periprosthetic joint infections, and these include Cutibacterium species. Fungi and mycobacterium are less common, among the fungi, candida species are particularly important. 
We know that up to 30% of periprosthetic joint infections are polymicrobial. And interestingly, certain species such as Craigslist negative staph and enterococci are particularly associated with polymicrobial infections. In chronic osteomyelitis, bacteria adhere to bone and, um, and adhere, adhere to dead bone and form bowel films. Um, again, step aureus is the most common, followed by coagulous negative step, especially when hardware is involved. The fibronectin binding protein is expressed on most clinically relevant strains of step aureus, and it, um, it is critical for the adherence of bacteria to osteoblasts. And it has been shown in vitro that step aureus biofilm adhering to um, osteoblasts reduce osteoblast viability and increase bone resorption. So sequesters promote biofilm formation and biofilms adhering to bone promote further bone, um, bone destruction. A biofilm has been described as a structured, com structured community of bacteria um, enclosed in a self-produced polymeric matrix and adherent to a surface. Bacteria attached to a surface develop into a mature biofilm and parts are dispersed, which allow the biofilm to spread and colonize a new surface. The planktonic bacteria are free-floating organisms, and you can think of them as bacteria that live a nomadic lifestyle, whereas biofilm bacteria prefer a sedentary and community-based lifestyle. <laughs> These are just some of the scanning electron microscopy images showing what bowel films look like. And if you can see in A, Pseudomonas species, in B, E. coli, and in C, catheter-associated staph aureus bowel film. Most people think about bowel film in a monomicrobial um, setting, but it's important to remember that many bowel films are polymicrobial. The image F shows you a mixed bowel film of streptococcus mutants and candida albicans. When bacteria live as a community, they resist attack and killing by the host immune system. Bowel from bacteria um, protect themselves from the host immune system by a process called frustrated phagocytosis. As you can see here, a human phagocyte encounters a planktonic bacterium in red and engulfs it. But as a bowel film develops and bacteria um, uh, forms that extracellular matrix of slime, then the human phagocytes and um, antibodies can no longer kill them. Yeah. Additionally, the activated phagocytes produce enzymes and toxic compounds, which leads to death of um, healthy host cells. And the necrotic debris then provides additional substrate for the biofilm community to expand. When bacteria live as a community, they um, become much less susceptible to antibiotics, even if they are highly susceptible as individual organisms. Several mechanisms contribute to the tolerance of biofilm bacteria to antibiotics and to its phenotypic resistance. First, restricted penetration of antibiotics through the biofilm occurs because the antibiotics bind to components in the biofilm matrix or are inactivated by enzymes in the matrix. Second, the metabolic activity of bacteria is um, reduced in the inner layer of the bowel films, and some bacteria develop into um, a dormant state called persistent cells. So the reduced metabolism um, allowed bacteria to escape the, um, the, um, the activity of antibiotics that target fundamental cellular processes of growing bacteria. And lastly, the low oxygen tension in the biofilm inhibits the reactive oxygen species dependent effect of bactericidal antibiotics. As I've mentioned at the beginning of the talk, periprosthetic joint infections are associated with biofilm on the surface of the implant, which informs diagnosis and treatment. Because it's a biofilm infection, it significantly reduces the sensitivity of culturing synovial fluid. So um, sampling um, biofilm on a uh, transplant <coughs> implant surface requires um, implant sonification or sampling of periprosthetic tissue to establish a microbiological diagnosis.
And because it's a bowel film infection, we need to combine surgery and antibiotics, and we need to give antibiotics at higher dosage and for longer periods. Several strategies have been developed to overcome the intrinsic antimicrobial tolerance of um, bowel film bacteria. Topical administration of antibiotics, such as antibiotic impregnated cement and spacer, are able to achieve high concentrations by um, providing and by delivering antibiotics directly to the site of infection. A combination of antibiotics is often used with the aim of preventing or delaying the onset of resistance. And choosing antimicrobial agents that attack metabolically active layers with agents that preferentially kill bowel film bacteria with low metabolic activity provides a rational approach for establishing a combination therapy. The choice of antibiotics in any infection is critical. And as Benzo has already mentioned, for orthopedic infections, antibiotics must achieve high concentration in the bone and in tissues around the bone. And antibiotics must be active against bowel film bacteria by targeting um, stationary phase bacteria and adhering bacteria. Rifamycin are the most active antibiotics against bowel film of staphylococci and fluoroquinolone against those of gram-negative bacilli. It's recommended that an initial intravenous therapy is given um, for a period of about five days before starting rifampicin or fluoroquinolone therapy to reduce the bacterial load and reduce the potential risk of developing resistance. And it's also important to remember that rifampicin should be started, um, sorry, shouldn't be started before a wound is completely closed because resistance can develop from skin flora transmitted into an open wound. So the rest of my talk will be focusing on the evidence for rifampicin combination therapy for staphylococcal periprosthetic joint infections. In this in vitro study, um, Silicon discs were colonized with MRSA and exposed to various antibiotics. Rifampicin is unique compared to the others. On day one, after just four hours of exposure, rifampicin was the most effective antibiotics in reducing the microbial burden. But after five days of exposure, rifampicin did not reduce microbial burden further and was associated with the emergence of resistance. But adding rifampicin to vancomycin or linezolid clears MRSA colonization rapidly and results in complete eradication of MRSA in bowel film by day two. So rifampicin combination therapy is strongly recommended in treatment guidelines for staphylococcal periprosthetic joint infections. And that's based on observational studies and one small randomized controlled trial done in 1998. In this study, patients with orthopedic device-related infections um, received initial debridement and a two-week course of intravenous fluoxetine or vancomycin with or without rifampicin, followed by ciprofloxacin rifampicin combination therapy or ciprofloxacin monotherapy for three to six months. All 12 patients in the rifampicin combination group had, um, cure, um, had cure at one year compared to just 58% in the ciprofloxacin monotherapy group. The results are excellent, but there are a few caveats. First, the sample size is small, which limits statistical power. Second, a significant proportion of patients in the rifampicin group dropped out due to adverse events. And third, the choice of ciprofloxacin monotherapy in the control group, which nowadays is regarded as inferior therapy for the treatment of anti for the treatment of staphylococcal PJI. And in this study, four or five treatment failures in the control group were due to cipro emergent cipro ciprofloxacin resistance. Subsequently, another small randomized controlled trial enrolled patients with early staphylococcal periprosthetic joint infections, and patients were randomized to receive cloxacillin or vancomycin with and without rifampicin for six weeks. In this study, adding rifampicin to standard treatment with anti-staphylococcal antibodies, I'm um, sorry, anti antibiotics did not um, improve cure rate at two years. 
This was a systematic review looking at rifampicin use in staphylococcal hip and knee periprosthetic joint infections. Treatment outcomes were stratified for type of joint and for type of organisms. As you can see here, treatment outcome was better for knee periprosthetic joint infections in patients who received rifampicin, but not for hip PJIs. And overall, treatment um, cure rate was higher in, um, in studies in which rifampicin was given compared to studies in which rifampicin was not given or not mentioned by the authors. But one needs to consider selection bias in retrospective cohort studies because um, outcomes of many patients who did not receive rifampicin are often not evaluated and survival bias because um, in some studies, patients can only be analyzed in the long-term rifampicin use group if they survive the first weeks of treatment. A meta-analysis was done for studies in which patients who was treated with rifampicin could be compared to patients not treated with rifampicin. And as you can see here in this forest plot, if it's on the right side that favors rifampicin, if it's on the left side that favors the comparator. And here we are looking at the relative risk of treatment success, which was similar between the rifampicin and non-rifampicin regimens. Um, so the use of rifampicin is associated with a 10% increase in success rate, but the confidence interval for the relative risk includes one. So there is no evidence of a significant um, association between rifampicin use and treatment success. And in this large multi-center prospective observational study, patients with um, periprosthetic joint infections were followed up to one year. The clinical cure was defined as no sign of infection at one year, and treatment success was defined as clinical cure plus implant still in place. 69% had um, treatment, sorry, clinical cure, and 54% had treatment success. And further analysis was done stratified for the use of rifampicin. And as you can see here, treatment success was similar between patients who was treated with rifampicin compared to patients not treated with rifampicin. And this lack of association between rifampicin use and treatment success did not differ when analysis was restricted to patients with staphylococcal infection and to those with staphylococcal infection who also received at least 14 days of rifampicin. So in conclusion, we clearly understand that periprosthetic joint infections and chronic osteomyelitis are biofilm-associated infections. The tolerance of biofilm bacteria to antibiotics and response from the host immune system make eradication challenging, and this underpins the need for debridement and the use of prolonged course of um, a combination of antibiotics. The most active antibiotics for bowel films are rifamycin for staphylococci and furoquinolone for gram-negative bacilli. Rifampicin must never be used alone because it selects rapidly for resistance. And finally, the use of um, rifampicin combination therapy um, is often used in practice. And although there is substantial in vitro and animal data supporting its use, the clinical evidence is conflicting. We need um, a well-conducted and adequately powered randomized controlled trial to definitively settle this question. Thank you.